Good evening, everyone. We are starting now lecture number nine from the second edition of the collaboration between the Japan House São Paulo and the School of International Relations at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. The main goal of the events is to promote debates between Japanese and Brazilian scholars on some of the most relevant international relations issues today, while also making them open and have free access to the public. On this occasion, we're welcoming Professor Dr. Naoko Kumagai and Professor Dr. Matias Spector to talk about global governance, multilateral forms, focusing on the roles of Japan and also Brazil. As usual, we inform that the statements expressed during the event represent only personal opinions and not necessarily the institutional position of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. And also all present here have agreed to participate and have consented to be recorded in this broadcast. The audience is encouraged to participate by sending questions during the entire event through the Slido platform. The link to send the questions is available in the event description on YouTube. And tonight, the main lecture will be given by Professor Dr. Naoko Kumagai, Professor at the School of Global Studies at Aoyama Gakuin University in Japan, having received her PhD in political science from the City University of New York. Professor Kumagai, we're thrilled to have your collaboration. Thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Good evening and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Naoko Kumagai uh, from Japan. So good morning from Japan. Today I'd like to talk about the issue of the Japan's participation in global governance, United Nations and Japan's multilateral diplomacy. Uh, with this title, let me uh, share the screen here. Excuse me. Yeah, here in the screen, you can see the title of my talk, the Japan's Japanese role of participation in the UN, global governance and multilateral institutions. Japan's multilateral diplomacy in a new geopolitical era. Then um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I'd like to thank uh, to the School of International Relations at Gaterio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo and the Japan House, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Then I'd like to characterize Japan's multilateral diplomacy in a new geopolitical era with such an order, as you can see in the list of contents. It is first with the characterization of the advent of the new geopolitics in our current world. And secondly, Japan and the United Nations and Japan's role in regional cooperation, particularly in East and Southeast Asia, and Japan's role in global governance to address global challenges and Japan's multilateral security cooperation. And I will conclude the characterization of Japan's multilateral diplomacy in an era of new geopolitics. Then first, let me explain my view of the advent of the new geopolitics. Well, as many of you know, geopolitics is about this way of, I mean, political thinking about the behaviors of states with um, significant consideration of the elements of geography the location topology, whether it is a continental state or an island state, and then the closeness to the, the, the major powers. And then uh, I think that kind of consideration in diplomacy has been uh, becoming more important nowadays. And then we have been witnessing more growing cases of geopolitical phenomena, such as the rise of China uh, to the um, South China Sea, and, and also in its assertiveness um, in the East China Sea. And then also the ongoing situation in Ukraine, Russia's violent resistance against the NATO expansion. So uh, we have to keep this in mind uh, in thinking about multilateral diplomacy. Then, but simultaneously, when we say that it is a new geopolitics, it is not a re revival of traditional geopolitics, we have to pay attention to the new characteristics we have now today. First, we have challenges to the liberal international order, um, which we have been enjoying in terms of human rights, freedom, the rule of law and democracy in many parts of the world. 
And so this, the revival of geopolitics is sometimes it's also a challenge to the, the current uh, liberal international order. And at the same time, there is a growing nationalism. It is not based on the national state necessarily. It is more like ethnic oriented, sometimes more cultural oriented nationalism. And we, we also have the impact of globalization. It, even with the rise of geopolitical thinking, we are not totally divided. We are very much connected with each other in a very fast way, in a deep way. And we have these ongoing global challenges such as pandemic and climate change, which is which are the crisis for all. And nobody can be, I mean, escaped from these, I mean, global challenges. So that's the quite complex situation we face now as the new geopolitics. Then how to understand Japan's role in multilateral diplomacy in this era. In terms of Japan's role in the UN, first, let me just go back uh, from Japan's I mean, contribution to the UN. Uh, Japan has been a significant uh, financial contributor to the UN budget, I mean, regular budget and PKO budget. Uh, let me just jump to the next slide. Here you can see the table of uh, Japan's recent um, contribution to UN regular budget on the right side, and then also UN PKL budget scale um, on, the, on the right side, sorry, the regular budget on the left side in the screen. And then Japan is the number three contributor, almost 9% of the total budget for UN regular budget, and then also for UN PKL budget, following the US and China. Japan used to be number two, but Japan still remains as one of the main contributors, financial contributors to the UN activities. Then let me be back to the original, the former slide here. So Japan has been very active um, for the contribution to the UN. And then UN-centered diplomacy has been one of Japan's traditional diplomacy pillars. And Japan has been also very active in the taking initiative for Security Council reform. Uh, Japan has been cooperating with Brazil through Group 4, uh, which is composed of Brazil, Japan, Germany, and India. And then the reason for this initiative is obviously because the Security Council has not been perfectly functioning. And then one of the reasons for Japan's I mean, initiative is because Japan is one of the biggest financial contributor, and also Japan also is equipped with knowledge and wisdom to reform because Japan has rich experiences as non-permanent member of the Security Council. Actually, Japan has served 11 times as non-permanent member of the Security Council so far. This is the, I mean, the, the highest number. But at the same time, Japan has this weakness. Japan cannot join in military operation or enforcement operation or collective security of the United Nations. So Japan, which also means that Japan cannot, and I mean, participate in enforcement and humanitarian intervention. This is due to our constitution restraints. We have the so-called peace constitution. And uh, let me just briefly share the contents of this peace constitution. In our Japanese constitution, we have Article 9, which is which main message is the renunciation of war. And here, let me read some parts with this underlined part. The Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. And the right of the legitimacy of the state will not be recognized. So that is our constitution. So let me be back. We have restrictions in a participation in UN operations. So we could not participate in the first Gulf War in 1991. And then that was a very uh, diplomatic problem for Japan. Then Japan made um, change by enact enacting a new law with a more flexible interpretation of the constitution so that Japan can participate in international operations by the UN and then and also through other multilateral corporations. 
Then with this new 1992 act, uh, Japan has become, I mean, able to dispatch personnel, I mean, both self-defense force and police and do 13 UN peacekeeping operations since 1992. And then other types of operations such as humanitarian relief operations, election observations and contributions in kind. And then here, let me share this, I mean, um, figure. I mean, this is uh, information from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan that uh, you can see, particularly this orange uh, sign, UN peacekeeping operations, to show where Japan has been cooperating. Is Timor, Nepal, Golan Heights, Sudan, South Sudan, Angola, Mozambique, Haiti, and El Salvador, El Salvador. So Japan has been very active. And then Japan has been also active in other types of operations. But of course, this is within the uh, I mean, Article 9 constraints. Then let me just figure out how, what kind of actually re limitations Japan has in participating in UNPKO. This can be understood well if we use this comparison of the principles of um, PKO. When on the right side of this table, you can see the five principles of self-defense force of Japan participation in UNPKO. And then on the right side, you can see the regular UN principles of UNPKO operation. Then let me just introduce the basic five principle of Japan, that we need ceasefire from the conflicting parties before entering into UNPKO members. And we need consent of the host country and the parties to the armed conflict. And the third, we need neutrality. We need to operate based on neutrality. And fourth, um, we suspend any operation when the first three principles are no longer being met. And fifth, there's a min minimum use of force only for self-defense. Then how these five principles of Japan being um, applied or I mean actually used or not used in the UN. First of all, UNPK nowadays no longer has the ceasefire assumption used to in a traditional UNPKO. And second, this the consent of the host country and the parties, this is um I mean requisite for the principle of the UNPKO. But the third one, neutrality. It has been changed to impartiality recently in the UN, but Japan remains as neutrality as an operational principle. And fourth, UN PKO principle does not have this, I mean, principle that, I mean, they will suspend the operation when the first three principles are no longer being met. And then fifth, in terms of the minimal use of force only for self-defense, the UN also has this basic principle, no use of force except in self-defense. However, UN also has this clause that no use of force in defense of the mandate. Um, uh, sorry, this is um, the use of force uh, is only for the self-defense and the use of force, I mean, in, only in defense of the mandate. So in case of the United Nations, the protections of civilians as happening in South Sudan uh, is, I mean, the use of force for that mandate is possible, but that is not possible for Japan. So with this, I mean, I mean limitations, then Japan mainly dispatched the self-defense forces engineering unit to UN operation, not the infantry unit. So accordingly, Japan's main operation in UN peace operations, uh, more like an infrastructural support, more like a back support. And let me now introduce several types of I mean, Japan's, I mean, that several cases with Japan's cooperation. Uh, this case in Rwanda is not based on that UNPKO, but we made an international peace cooperation for the refugees from Rwanda. 
uh, when there was a massacre in 1994, uh, many Rwandan refugees, as many of you know, fled the country and then to Zaire, uh, which is the current Democratic Republic of Congo. And then uh, self-defense forces members provided medical service, water supply, and then quarantine uh, in this, I mean, Zaire, near the border with Rwanda. Uh, this is a photo of, I think, the ongoing operation. And we also have a case from uh, Uganda and South Sudan. Um, when there was, uh, unfortunately, there was, I mean, civil war, kind of civil war broke out in I mean, South Sudan um, after its independence. And then the UNMIS started, UN mission in South Sudan. And then Japanese self-defense forces participated, but not as a, um, not, excuse me, not for the protection of civilians, but for infrastructure support and also to provide civil works to improve water supply and also sanitation. And so even though we cannot make a direct support for the people uh, under, I mean, uh, damage, but we can also support refugees in different ways. That is where this JICA, Japan International Corporate Agency, works. Actually, there were many, quite a significant number of Rwandan, uh, so Sudanese refugees uh, uh, flooding towards uh, Uganda. Then JICA, this Japan International Cooperation Agency, helped Uganda as a host country of South Sudanese refugees by improving the capacity of Uganda, by improving infrastructure, such as schools and roads, livelihood, governance of one, I mean, Uganda, and also by providing uh, integrative information on the location of health centers, the location of refugee settlements. So yes, just for your information with a map, with this South Sudan's I mean, internal conflict, in different locate directions, there was a flow of refugees. This is a map from UNHCR. Then significant number of refugees to Uganda. And here on the right side of this slide, you can see the map of Uganda. And in the Northwest part of Uganda is bordering with South Sudan. So in this region, Northwest part of Uganda's region, West Nile district, JICA helped the local people to improve their governance infrastructure to accept refugees. So by collecting information about the sites of uh, wells and sites of health centers, medical service centers, and it's the sites of refugees so that they will figure out where to set up new medical centers new hospitals and they were to excavate new wells. That way, I mean, people can have more efficient um, um, empowerment or uh, development of this region of Uganda to host, not just for the development of um, Uganda, but also to host refugees better. And let me move on to the next case. Uh, next case is um, also the PKO, I mean, activities, but with a more creative I mean, methods of so-called all Japan contribution. Japanese self-defense forces participate in the UNPKO in East Timor. And one of the operation of the self-defense force as a part of UN mission of support in East Timor, UMSEP, was the construction of main road, main roads. That is for the better, I mean, performance of the mandate of the UN mission in um, UMSET. But local people in UMSET, I mean, in East Timor, they needed their own, I mean, daily life, I mean, roads, like uh, local roads. But these, the construction of local roads was not part of the agenda of the UN. Then Japanese ODA project was the cooperation of UNDP started this project of local road construction and self-defense force working in, in East Timor 
also helped this ODA project. And when the self-defense force left East Timor with the completion of its mission as UN mission, um, SDF, self-defense force, donated machinery and compounds to the East Timorese government, such as bulldozers and then the, the houses they used to stay. Then, but we need the management and the maintenance for these machinery equipment. Then Japanese NGO helped the East Timorese government to manage and maintain those machinery left or donated by the SDF. So this is the all Japan, the different sectors from Japan, what ODA, SDF, and the Japanese NGO, they helped East Timor by coupling their activities with the UN mission. So this way, even though Japan is not very, um, it's more like a back support, like infrastructure support in the UN system, UNPKO or UNP's mission, but it is very creative. And Japan has been also very active in providing human resource capability building. Uh, we have a growing number of civil wars and ethnic conflicts, particularly in Africa. And of course, the UN will upgrade its operation. I mean, namely, for example, the protection of civilians, like in the case of South Sudan. Then they also cooperate with the regional organizations such as the African Union, like in the case of Darfur. But I mean, how can Japan contribute to this very complicated civil wars and ethnic conflicts? I mean, just upgrading Japan's operation to enforcement would not necessarily work because Japan is not really so uh, close, I mean, historically or culturally to Africa. So in this case, the best way for Japan to contribute is to serve as educator and trainer for better peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building. Then Japanese self-defense forces and Japanese government dispatch personnel for special lectures and training for peacekeeping operations, peace um, building uh, in such places as the International Peace Support Training Center in Nairobi, Kenya, the Ethiopian International Peace Training Center, and also in the peacekeeping school at Bamako, Mali. So you can see that Japanese has um, Japanese activity has been very, very creative because of this restriction. Then next, let me move on to the topic of Japan's regional cooperation. Well, unfortunately in Far East Asia or East Asia, we have I mean, geopolitical challenges. I mean, North Korea's nuclear missile threats, the rise of China. And the thing is that we do not have any multilateral security framework. Uh, we do not have NATO or OSCE. And then even though we have some kind of a cooperation among the major powers in the region, Japan, China, and Korea, like um, the, the trilateral summit meeting, but this meeting is, I mean, annually, then frequently, uh, cancelled because of the dispute of uh, history issues. So, and we also have some pragmatic cooperation or functional cooperation going on, but that does not touch upon the security issues. Then, but instead, in a wider context, we have ASEAN Regional Forum, which contains both Japan, Korea, and China. And it is an important arena for dialogue, which I can show you in this. Um, Figure, which is I mean, also from the Foreign Ministry of Japan. You can see here this uh, purple shaded area is the ASEAN members. And then we have this ARF ASEAN Regional Forum with this uh, red line area. Then Japan is part of this ASEAN Regional Forum here. And China, Korea, then we also have in ASEAN Regional Forum, North Korea here. So ASEAN Regional Forum is very important, particularly for Japan, since Japan has no diplomatic relationship with North Korea. So we have that kind of arena, but sometimes people criticize that ASEAN Regional Forum is more like a talk shop without any concrete action. 
Well, that's the system, how it works. So we need more institutionalization for more frequent periodical meetings. And then, of course, annual meeting in like a summit meeting or ARFs for a ministerial meeting, fine, but that is, I mean, annual, not often. And then that kind of meeting would be significantly impacted by domestic situations of the participant countries. But if we have more frequent, like a weekly or bi-weekly meeting among ambassadors, um, then we can have more solid common understanding and then confidence building, which will be less affected by regime change of domestic factors or the participant countries. So, I mean, the Japan's role in regional, I mean, regional cooperation has some room for more efforts. And then let me move on to the next topic about Japan's participation in global governance in addressing global challenges. Well, needless to say, I mean, we have many challenges, I mean, global warming, extreme poverty, COVID-19, um, then other types of, I mean, disasters which requires humanitarian aid. And then the basically Japan's stance towards those, I mean, challenges uh, is based on human security, local ownership, human resource development. And then th these are also the pillars of Japan's ODA, official, official development assistance. And then Japan utilized these uh, pillars in joining in this global governance in different ways. And then the recent characteristics is the public-private cooperation in addressing these issues through global governance. And then um, that was obvious in COVID case and also in a climate change, uh, for example, um, many more Japanese uh, institutional investors have been participating in the principles for their responsible investment, the investment with consideration for environment, uh, sustainability, and the governance. And then I think, I mean, less than 100, but close to 100 Japanese investor, institutional investors uh, now members of these principles. And then we also have this Japan platform which is a network of NGOs and Japanese government and Japanese corporations business. It is a tripartite system of cooperation among this NGO business and the government of Japan. So that I mean, we can join in global governance in a more effective way. For example, I mean, Japanese government decided to provide um, 20 million US dollars a year for the activities of NGOs for their humanitarian aid for people in Ukraine. So then I would like to also uh, point out this, I mean, uniqueness of Japan. The unique, Japan utilizes its unique weakness uh, in joining global governance. That means that Japan is very fragile, vulnerable to natural disasters, earthquake, tsunami, and typhoon. So, but that's why Japan is very, much ready for disaster risk management. So we utilize, try to share this wisdom we have accumulated so far. Then one of the example is this initiative in disaster risk redu redu reduction. And in the third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction uh, back in 2015, conducted in Sendai, which city was also suffered from the big earthquake in 2011, uh, the conference, succeeded in the mainstreaming of the disaster risk reduction in the international community. So Japan utilizes uh, its um, wisdom, which was a result of Japan's weakness um, in helping global governance. Then in participating in multilateral cooperation or global governance, as I mentioned that Japan pay attention to human security, local ownership, and then I can say that particularly the sense of equality and the human-centered approach matter for Japan's, I mean, approach for multilateralism or global governance participation. And in that we can see in historical trace, uh, for example, uh, you can see this Fukuda doctrine, uh, former Prime Minister Fukuda back in 1977, made this doctrine and announced towards Southeast Asian nations that uh, let me just highlight this on the underlined part, heart-to-heart -heart relationship. 
and also peace and prosperity throughout Southeast Asia as an equal partner. So Japan pretty much pay attention to this I mean, human-based and equality thinking. And then this is partly because of the history lessons, because as you know, Southeast Asia was the arena of the victim, the victimization of Japan's military aggression during the wartime, Second World War. And also Japan has this sen sense that we are all equal, we cooperate on equal footing. So we do not use the term of aid, I mean, unless it is really need used for some official term. We rather think it is as a like a development cooperation. So for example, one of Japan's ODA agency, Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, they don't say that Japan International Aid Agency, they say that Japan International Cooperation Agency. Then let me move on to the next topic about Japan's security cooperation in multilateral arena. And then I think I have to address this issue of nuclear um, because Japan is the only country which suffered from nuclear weapons, the actual use of nuclear weapons. So that's why we have these three non-nuclear principles as one of the diplomatic principles, not possessing, not producing, and not permitting the introduction of nuclear weapons. But at the same time, simultaneously, Japan is relying on the US extended nuclear deterrence. Yeah. How to explain this uh, twist? Then actually this twist is ex expressed as Japan's no participation in the treaty of the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Then people think, I mean, people in com international community say, that why not join in Japan even as an observer? you are the only country which suffered from nuclear weapons. Well, the reality is that we rely on US extended nuclear deterrence. So it's very difficult for Japan to openly say that, I mean, we immediately prohibit nuclear weapons, but we pledge that nuclear aversion is the ultimate goal. Then Japan's explanation is that Japan will serve as a bridge between the haves and have nots the nuclear powers and then non-nuclear powers. Because the, if you really want to have non-nuclear uh, abolition as a reality, you need cooperation from nuclear powers, particularly Russia and America. So and obviously Russia and America, they are not the parties to the prohibition of nuclear weapons treaty. So what is important is that to talk with them, but also to also I mean, listen to the frustration from the non-nuclear powers and their concerns. So Japan preached that with the ultimate goal of nuclear aberration, but Japan was preached I and mean, serve as a bridge between the haves and have-nots. Then let me move on to the next topic of security, the free and open in the Pacific and the quadrilateral uh, security dialogue, the so-called FOIP and Quad. These are the quite, um, I mean, remarkable, I mean, multilateral initiatives uh, Japan has made. I mean, FOIP is for the promotion of peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. And then it is for the ensuring rule-based international order, such as the rule of law, freedom of navigation, of right, peaceful settlement of disputes, and promotion of free trade. And then Quad is a low security cooperation, like a joint security um, military exercises among the US, Japan, India, and Australia, in, including intelligence sharing. Now, the reason for these initiatives from Japan is obviously the rise of China, but also geopolitically speaking, oceans are very important. Japan is a, such a small island country uh, located in the far west of um, I mean, I mean, Pacific Ocean, but very connected with Southeast Asia through, I mean, the I mean, South China Sea and also to the Indian Ocean. And then for Japan's modernization, ocean was very important. Japan learned a lot from the West. And uh, let me just share this, um, excuse me, um, let me share a new, um, excuse me. Uh, new screen, uh, which is um, 
this is also the, the material from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This is a visual image of the port. The, we connect the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, and then the ASEAN as an important, I mean, focus area of connectivity. And then this area reaches Africa, Middle East, and of course, Asia, and then the North and then Central and then Latin America. So we try to create a public good, um, international public good for the prosperity and peace of this region. That is the idea of POIP. Then for Japan, accessing America, accessing to Europe through the Indian Ocean was very important for its modernization. So of course, FOIP has some, like, I mean, some message to China, but China is also a beneficiary of, uh, I mean, of um, beneficiary of a FOIP, I mean, recipient of the benefit of FOIP as um, international public good. Then uh, let me move on to the, original slideshow. So that's the background of FOIP. Then people might raise questions. Well, this is a revival of Japan's military assertiveness. That, but the answer is no, because this is totally multilateral. This is not unilateral. And then we have a bitter lesson of unilateral action from the pre-war period. See, I mean, let me read this statement of Mr. Abe, our former minister, prime minister, back in 2015. Japan gradually transformed itself into a challenger to the international order that the international community sought to establish after tremendous sacrifices. Japan took the wrong course and advanced along the road to war. And 70 years ago, Japan was defeated. So this is the reflection of the wrong path Japan took during the wartime and the pre-war period. So that's a bitter lesson of unilateralism. And also, maybe people might think that particularly FOIP is an economic decoupling or separation of China, but the answer is also no. We can't be separated from China. I mean, whether India or Australia, America, Japan, we are very much closely connected with China economically and also Southeast Asian nations as well. And then actually Japan has a pragmatic cooperation with China in the Belt and Road Initiative initiatives, infrastructure investment, but only with the condition of the rules of openness, transparency, economic efficiency, and fiscal soundness. So as I said, FOIP is more like an international public because it is open to everybody. It is not excluding somebody. And you can see that if you see the FOIP area in terms of this more like an economic cooperation, I mean, figure, we have RCEP recently concreted with these blue lines. And then we also have CPTPP um, with this green line. Then Japan is really one of the centers of this big regional um, economic cooperation frameworks going on. Well, unfortunately, America is outside of CPTPP, but um, Japan, along with Australia and India, has been, I mean, serving as this multilateral force for economic cooperation in the region. Then in this multilateral cooperation, I have to note this particular uniqueness of Japan. Japan takes a very realist approach to democracy and human rights issues, even though this FOIP is based on this freedom and democracy rule of law. And then, for example, I mean, in the recent case of the coup d'etat in Myanmar back in 2012-21, Japan's reaction was different from America or European Union's reactions. I would say it is rather milder reactions, no sanctions on Myanmar's military regime, and then only in the cancellation of new ODA projects. Then the reason for this kind of mild approach of Japan in terms of human rights democracy is because Japan has a, best, has a very unique identity of bridge uh, between the East and the West or bridge in the world. Let me read this statement of I mean, former Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu uh, when Japan enrolled in the United Nations back in December 1956. The substance of Japan's political, economic, and cultural life is the product of the fusion within the last century of the civilizations of the Orient and the Occident. In a way, 
Japan may well be regarded as a bridge between the East and West. She is fully conscious of the great responsibilities of such a position. So that is a Japan's unique identity. So Japan is the bridge between the East and the West. And also Japan is also a bridge between developed countries and developing countries because Japan used to be developing countries. So we know what it is like. So Japan's role is to perform as a kind of um, agent with good faith efforts for mutual understanding of the both sides. So conclusion. So Japan has different phases in multilateral efforts in this new geographical geopolitical era. Japan has, I mean, some kind of constraints in UN operation, but it is more creative. And but in regional institutionalization, Japan has a uh, more room for efforts for, I mean, institutionalization. And Japan has this a very unique uh, sense of equality and human oriented approach in global governance. And also Japan's multilateralism based on geopolitical and historical uniqueness um, um, is, um, has been carried on and it will be carried uh, to be continued um, uh, in Japan's foreign policy. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'm sorry that I exceeded the time. Thank you very much. It's not a problem, Professor. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. And as we proceed to the discussions, I introduce our commentator, Professor Dr. Machit Spector, Associate Professor and Founder of, of the School of International Relations at Fundação Getúlio Vargas, having received his PhD in International Relations from Oxford University. Professor Spector, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Luan, and thank you lots, Dr. Kumagai. It was a pleasure to listen to you, and I would be very happy to just put forward a couple of questions that I think come out of your presentation, and I think would be useful for our uh, viewers to see you go through. You've presented a setting in which Japan, over the past eight decades now, has built alongside the United States and under the US security umbrella, a rules-based international order. And this was essential for Japan. So Japan could develop its economy and rebuild itself after the war without having to resort to the use of force. So very clearly Japan built a rather sturdy, stable approach to international relations these past eight decades. In the last decade, however, the challenges have been enormous, partly because China has risen. And although Japan has made it a point, as you very clearly put it, Japan has made an effort to draw China into this rules-based order. On some instances, China has, of course, challenged the rules-based order. I mean, the uses of the sea are a good example, and this is not just Chinese incursions in the Japanese waters, but also in waters across Latin America, for example. So the two questions I have for you, and I would love to listen to you address them, are these. The first one is, now that very clearly we move into a more multipolar world, where China is more overtly competing against the United States, but also Russia is competing more overtly against the United States, as we now see. How do you see cooperation between China and Russia in Asia? What are the prospects of China and Russia cooperating with one another to challenge the rules-based order built mainly by the United States, but operated in Asia by Japan alongside the United States. What's your vision for the future on that front? My second question, Professor Kumaga, is this. You've shown us that Japan is a very strong supporter of the liberal international order. But my question is, what do you think is the domestic support in Japan for that order? My understanding is that overwhelmingly, the Japanese population is supportive of the grand strategy of Japan. But I'm wondering whether 
there are voices inside Japan that begin to challenge this notion. And the reason I ask this is because as we look around the globe, in Europe and in, indeed inside the United States itself, we now see a lot of challengers stepping up against the liberal international order. Is there anything similar in Japan? Is there a sort of neo-populist wave in Japan, either politicians or opinion makers or academics who defend an alternative vision for Japanese grand strategy in an age of multipolarity? And I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Spector, for the very sharp uh, insightful questions and then from a very big view, uh, which I really appreciate. Uh, in terms of the first question, uh, in yeah, it is, I mean, unfortunately, the world is now heading towards rather multipolar rather than multilateralism. And then um, it is becoming more clear uh, over the past month or so. Then in terms of the potential or prospects for the cooperation between China and then Russia in Asia, actually I think that they are, that cooperation would not be so close. Uh, maybe they are uh, close when they face the United States, but not necessarily um, in other parts. Because for example, China's a one belt, one road project that really crosses like a Kazakhstan and then those, the, I wouldn't say the backyard of Russia, but the, the former Soviet Union area. I mean, then, I mean, this is quite an economic project in which merit those regions, but obviously um, Russia is not happy about that. The Russia, Russia is not, I mean, openly opposing it. And then it's, it also depends how we understand, I mean, the Mr. Putin's, I mean, ideas about, I mean, circumstances, the ongoing situation. Some people say that that is a defensive activity because NATO is expanding. That's why, I mean, Russia is pushing back. It's quite defensive activity, but some said that Putin is really dreaming of the revival of the, of the Russian empire, the Soviet empire. So it is more like an offensive expansive. And then, I mean, it depends on how we understand this. I mean, offensive, defensive. I mean, I mean, stance of Russia, or I would say, Mr. Putin. Um, then, if Russia is really more like an, an offensive, I mean, stance, then I think this the Central Asia will be the issue of Central, I mean, Asia, the five republics in Central Asia will be really a problem issue for these two giants of, I mean, China and Russia soon, and. Um, uh, in terms of the 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 cooperation uh, in um, uh, Asia, um, I don't think it's gonna be really um, uh, I don't know how to say uh, that. I mean, it's there is no any particular element which motivates them to get together. I mean, if we do not think about the American factor, for example. Uh, Russia used to be very close to uh, Vietnam, but Vietnam has made this regime change, and then um, it, it's more closer to America, and then so um, it's very difficult for Russia to reach the East Asia uh, in a practical way, and then uh, in terms of um, well, I mean, you know, I would say that in terms of North Korea issue, I mean, both two countries, I mean, China and Russia, uh, they are more willing to lift the sanctions uh, for North Korea. So maybe they are on the front, same front in that issue area. But uh, I don't think that they have the, some specific, I mean, subject, positive subject or common purpose or common agenda to pursue together. Uh, they are more, I mean, cooperating when they face with the United States, I think. And then also if we see in a micro level, for example, the foreign policy of China, they wouldn't make an alliance particular because of this, I mean, their principles. So I think, um, I don't think that there is a clear, I mean, materialization of the cooperation of China and Russia. And then, um, and then simply speaking, even though we, we pay so much attention to Russia because of what is going on, but I mean, in terms of this national size and 
Russia is a rich country in natural resources and uh, very strong military forces. But um, I mean, in terms of the overall national um, interest scale, I mean, China is far bigger than Russia. And then I wonder in terms of the classic, I mean, the alliance formation theory, um, the pattern of cooperation between China and Russia Yes, that would be like a, making an alliance, the so-called alliance against America. But in other way, I think there is no motivation. There cannot be motivation for Russia to be with China in the, when we think about this I mean, national interest and gap between these two. And then for the second question, um, yeah, lim international, liberal international order. Yeah, um, yeah, I know there are much talk about the Japan's Japan becoming more like a ultra right and then coming back to the pre war Japan. And then, as I mentioned, slightly touched upon uh, in my presentation, I think I would say that that is rather misunderstanding. That's true. There are some people who said that Japan's war was a legitimate war. And then some say that in the middle, well, Japan's aggression in China was mistake that was an invasion, but Japan's attacks on Pearl Harbor was a self-defense. So we have those voices. But as I mentioned that um, basically, uh, I mean, in the Abe statement, I mean, uh, the Mr. Abe's, I mean, Prime Minister Abe's statement back in 2015, I mean, we explicitly show that our past was wrong. And then uh, we expressed a remorse and apologies so um, when we have the so-called neo-populism uh, in terms of the legitimizing the past of revisionism, I think that is not, I don't say that it is zero, but the overall public opinion is not that in that direction. And then um, when we had witnessed the so-called wave of populism in some parts of Europe in the mid 2010s and also in the, uh, in America, we also had a talk about maybe populism also in Japan, but my assessment is that we didn't have any the neo populism in Japan. Uh, maybe partly because we do not have so much, I mean, the, the wave of huge wave of refugees of the, I mean, like in the case of Germany. So we didn't have face we have not faced such an element which might trigger the rise of populism. But I think overall, I think, I mean, yes, we have some people who are very, very revisionist, but I wouldn't say that that has grown up to a level of populism. And then maybe I can, if I can may ask, I mean, what, what do you mean by the alternative vision as Argued by those so-called uh, neo-populists neo in Japan. Maybe the, if you can show what you mean by this alternative vision, maybe I can answer more completely. Uh, what I so meant far. was, you know, uh, around the globe, there are many leaders now who question the validity of the liberal international order, who argue that in a world of geopolitical competition, it's very hard to maintain a global rules-based order and therefore one should ditch that and invest in an alternative setting in which you have regional spheres of influence, in which you have more protectionism rather than globalization, and in which security competition takes precedence. So my question to you was, are there members of the diet, for example, who would like to see Japan not necessarily to go down the path of unilaterally changing its position, but of more of building a multilateral set of security postures. The expression you used was military assertiveness. You know, one way to express military assertiveness is unilateral, but you can do it multilaterally. So my question was, are there members of the Japanese political class who look at the world and say, the strategy for the past 70 years was good for the past 70 years, but is bound not to be good for the next 
70 years because the security setting, in particular with regards to China, is changing so fast. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe aggressiveness was a form of multilateralism. I mean, but, oh, Japan is using multilateralism as a disguise of the hidden agenda. Yeah, now I understand. But the thing is that we, we can't survive without international trade. And then, I mean, and then so, I mean, I mean, the reality and the talk is another thing, but the thing is that, I mean, even some very maybe folk, hawkish politicians, they understand that we can survive without the natural resources and food imported from abroad. So, I mean, if there's any, um, some move which seems quite, I mean, aggressive or assertive security stance from Japan, I think that is for the maintenance of this liberal order without which we can survive. I mean, freedom of I mean, trade and then free navigation. What if the tankers from the Middle East are suspended in the move in the South China Sea? We were gonna be very much in trouble. So I, mean, I think, I mean, we try to, I mean, address the issue of China's assertiveness of South China Sea, of course, for in terms of this normative issue of freedom, and then also the sovereignty issue. But we also we also have a very pragmatic reason for the transport of the natural resources to Japan. So I mean, understanding this, I mean, this, I mean, so-called multilateral, I mean, quoted multilateral security, I mean, aggressiveness or <laughs> proactive move from Japan as um, something, I mean, else. I mean. That is more for defensive, and then that is more for pragmatic reasons. And then, so, so it is not like a building a, like a regional sphere of influence again, like Japan did, and in terms of propaganda during the wartime. That, I mean, th we know that that was wrong, and then that was totally unequal among the members, and then. As I mentioned, that we know that the importance of this uh, equality, and we know that how much history issue that is a level of idea and memory, but that actually affects diplomacy at the national level of diplomacy. We know very painfully from the relationship with South Korea and China. So, I mean, of course, I mean, as a human, as a, and in terms of morale, we make a reflection upon it, but we also know that that affects our national interests in material basis. So um, maybe I'm not really persuasive enough, but I mean, those that so POIP and QUAD, they are more for the defense of the liberal international order. And that is important for the survival, physical survival of Japan. I know that I'm clear enough, but Great. that's all. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you very Luana. much. Thank you. As we unfortunately don't have much time left, I will proceed to the closing remarks. I would like to once again thank very much both professors for this rich exchange and also for agreeing to join us again tomorrow night as we swap roles and the main lecture will be given by Professor Spector. I also thank the Japan House São Paulo for supporting the initiative and of course our audience. To everyone in Brazil, a great night. And to Professor Kumagai, have a great day in Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good evening, everyone.